in California, and we are literally going back to the future right behind you. There he is. You probably want to get closer to the beautiful lady, actually. All right, so the way we're going to roll this is, I'm sure, so many of you. Let me see how many Back to the Future fans are we have here. Woo! Okay, so we just want to jump right in. We would love to get uh, questions from you in the audience. So if you do have a question, if you want to come and line up right here in front of the stage, feel free to come down. Don't be shy. We want to take those questions. So who's going to be first? Oh, me. The audience. I think they're approaching, what, the 35th anniversary of Back to the Future? Is that right, Chris? Very, yes. Very soon. And, and I was asking him backstage, did you ever think when you made the first Back to the Future that it would be as popular as it is today? Not really, really. We were really just hoping to have a good opening, a good premiere, and a good run. But it just don't stop loving. So, that's you, know, great. you know, a lot of people don't even realize, too, and I don't know if you people out here realize it, Back to the Future obviously was hugely popular, and probably the most, the thing that made you the most famous, when you, even though you, you've been on so many other things, right? Would you say Back to the Future is number one for you? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been the most popular. There was three of them. Uh, yeah, it, it uh, kind of but he also won three Emmys, I think, for Taxi, right, for Jim? Yeah! And he was Uncle Fester on The Addams Family. Yeah. Yeah. And also, are you ready for this, Liza? He was one of the inmates in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His very first role. Are you are you really that crazy in real life? I don't know. I did. I'm, I'm not a good judge. <laughs> Ask around. <laughs> Christopher, I would love to know one thing we were talking about backstage as well was with the DeLorean. You're so associated with the DeLorean. We had a bunch of people here asking you to sign that. How much driving of the DeLorean did you actually do when you filmed? Practically none. <laughs> crazy, right? Yeah, the stunt the stunt people. Uh, it most of the time. Yeah, I did. We usually had seeds in the DeLorean, um, and the car wasn't moving. It would just shoot. Have you ever, have you ever owned a DeLorean? Oh. No. Well, I, I am pleased to have one, but I, I, uh, it's ha it hasn't happened. I would think they would have given you a DeLorean, because... <laughs> Not too many of them around. There's a lot of them here today. <laughs> but, uh, kind of rare. I, and, and do you know, Liza, when he first came in today, tell tell what you did when you started out you the little parade that kicked off NostalgiaCon. Tell the audience what happened. Yeah, man, a little parade. Um, I was in the last DeLorean in the line and I waved. <laughs> did things like that. <laughs> so do you really feel like you're going back to the future every single time you get in? Does it take you back to a particular moment on set? It takes me back to the set. It doesn't that I, I don't feel particularly that I'm gonna go to another space time <laughs> zone. But it brings back a lot of that. Well Well, do you think we should go to the audience? Yeah. It's great to be able to get people right now. We have reality changers ready to ask the first question right there with this camera. Step right up right through the center. Right there. It's good. So we have a question from uh, here on the live, and uh, this person says that they've seen you on the on your one-act play at the Community Playwrights Theater in NYC. And even as famous as you are now, and continue to stay famous, what drives you to still perform to small audiences and community theaters? What? What drives you to still perform to small audiences in community theaters? Um, I just like to, to do it. Uh, I started out in the theater, so it's great to go back and get that feeling. And 
you get to do parts that you might never do anywhere else. I think summer I'm expected to do a career at the Berkshire Shakespeare Festival in Massachusetts. Wow. Yeah. I'd never get anybody calling me to do that on film. So I'm really, you know, it's one of the great roles of going to the theater and seeing the opportunity to test, test myself. And one more question from Charlie, you know, also he says, actually, Chango Mania, out of, the th out of the movies you've already made, is there a certain scene that you would like to do again? A scene? Yes. Um, there's like films I'd like to do again. Because I, I can feel it, you know, now, now I know what I wish I had done in the first place. Uh, well, that was a question. <laughs> is there a certain film that you would like to do over? A scene, a scene in the film. Uh, or just, is there a scene you wish you did differently after you did it? Well, that's hard to say, you know. Um, sometimes I see a film that I did many years ago, and I look at it and I say, if I had the opportunity to do it again, I might put it a bit here and there, you know, change this and change that. Because over time, you you think about things you've done and wish you'd done it a little bit differently. Do you ever look, do you ever wish you could get in that DeLorean and go back to the past and be docked differently? Uh, well, maybe somebody will come up with a script. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's the number one thing, script. Um, I know they're, they're saying they're not going to do another Back on the Future film. Minds could be changed if a writer comes up with an idea and a way of telling the story that we haven't done yet. And it's just such a such a great idea that you you can't turn it down. You've got to make that film. Uh, so that that might come to pass. You see. Have you a Back to the Future four? Has that ever almost happened? Uh, I'd be asked, and I'd be delighted. You know, I'd, I'd jump right on it. Why do you think it's never happened? I, I felt after the, the producers finished writing one, two, and three that they had a full story. That was the end of it. But as time passes, I, I know there's a lot of fans who would love to see a, third, a fourth one. Um, it might just be in their heads and someday a great script for trigger. Yeah, because you look exactly the same, you know? <laughs> you you could you could get right back into that role, man, and you could be absolutely loving that stuff. Yeah, I, I was at a QA uh, just a few years ago. Uh, answering questions of a little boy. Little boy stood up and gave a mic. And he said, Mr. Lloyd. How does it feel not to have to wear that old age makeup anymore? <laughs> I can't say the darkest things. Now, in terms of speaking of the movie, Christopher, was there one particular scene that stands out to you that is your favorite that you really love shooting that you can uh, share with us? I was chasing a train on horseback uh -huh. in Back to Future 3, and that was pretty exciting. Trains moving along. <laughs> and they, they wanted us, and in the end of the scene, I, uh, the character Doc grabs the handles of the train and pulls himself out of the saddle into the train. They didn't, you know, they didn't want me to do that. They, when, when they shot that moment, they wanted it to stop. And I was riding along, galloping along, I said the train, those handles were right there. I just so much wanted to grab it and pull myself on. I felt capable of it. But if I didn't get it right, it would have been kind of a catastrophe. So I, I, uh, I was afraid. I love that. All right, next question. Hey, Christopher. Uh, just a quick question. What's one thing you, you like about voice acting? Because uh, that's what I like about voice acting. Because uh, um, I know that you, for one, have a really great voice talent. 
um, like ever since the Page Master, DuckTales movie, Anastasia, and most recently Over the Garden Wall. How do I like to that? Yes. I, I like it. Um, when I first started doing you know, voice work, you know, I, I trained as an actor using all of me. Now I'm just going to be a voice. Wow, I really got into my love doing it. It's, it's not as easy as it seems because you have to get the same feeling into your voice as you do when it's, your whole self is on full. And it's, it, it's kind of the same deal. It's just it's the same. It's, but I, I, I love it. Did you get coaching for voice acting at all, or did you just te self teach yourself? I have. Uh, voice lessons. Really? Um, I, I did some singing uh, way back when I started. I, I take voice and how to project and breathe and all of that. Now I just kind of win. <laughs> I'm sure you could give the lessons yourself now, don't you guys agree? You know, one of those master classes. What is that? You know the master classes that they do online now? Yeah. You, you could do one of those. Uh -huh. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> Speaking of interesting, Christopher, can you share a little bit about what it was like meeting uh, Michael J. Fox for the first time, especially shooting the show, you know, the film, at the height of like what was going on with his career. He already had gotten a lot of fame from Family Ties. Uh -huh. So obviously you guys both went on to become, you know, legends for this movie. But I'm curious to know, and I'm sure the audience, what that chemistry was like when you first two met. Well, it was something. Um, an actor by the name of Eric Stoltz was cast as Marty the Richard. Really? Uh, uh, they had checked out with, with Marty J. Fox, but he was all tied up in his series, Family Ties. So, uh, uh, I just say the Family Ties, yeah, uh, Michael Eric Stoltz. Stoltz. Yeah, the, the other guy. Eric. Played Michael, Eric Stoltz played Michael for six weeks. And I thought he was doing fine, he's a wonderful actor. But they decided they had it after six weeks of shooting that they had to get Michael. And they worked it out somehow, and Michael, uh, one night we were working late with the city of industry, shooting all those initial shots. And about 1 a.m. we broke for dinner. And then they said, please everybody go to this area because we have an announcement today. And they let us know that the next day Michael J. Fox is going to be there. And we were reshooting about six weeks of work, which is very rare for that to happen. Wow. Uh, so Michael came on. <laughs> We started being Doc and Marty, and it was effortless. They, they wanted, they needed a certain flair for humor, for comedy that, that Michael has. And uh, we had the chemistry immediately that never left. And it's waiting for, for number four. <laughs> Did it, did it immediately feel better with Michael J. Fox? Yeah, it was kind of fluidness to it. Okay. You know, it, it's, not, not, it's not saying anything uh, negative about Eric Stoltz. It, it, life is just the perfect, perfect cast. Woo! That's awesome. I have two questions in one statement. Uh, uh, okay, number one. Uh, your first film role Tabor in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. If you can remember that far back, uh, when you first saw Jack Nicholson, what did you think of him? Oh, uh, Jack Nicholson, I, I, I already had a huge, I was a fan, a total fan, from the movies that he'd done previously. Easy Rider, Five Easy Pieces, Last Detail, and two or three others. I never had the uh, Cougar's Nest was my first film. And I had no imaginings that I'd ever been acting with Jack Nicholson. So when I came out on the set 
I saw him sitting there with the other actors out of blown away. And he was wonderful. He was wonderful to work with. A lot of the cast of Cooper's Nest, we were all young, inexperienced actors, and he just helped us give us give ourselves the best we had to give. Uh, very generous, great sense of humor, and uh, passionate, very courageous actor. Uh, loved him. That's what I thought. Hey, my second question. Huh? Among the... Uh, I don't know if you remember that far back uh, with this one, but uh, PBS Kids. It had a, it had a show about uh, about about the uh, about the world about the World Wide Web as it was as it was assumed when it was new. Uh, called Cyber Chase. You were the hacker, uh, uh, and according to reports, the, the, the hacker. Uh, right. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, and, uh, it's according to reports, you were, you were to, you were, uh, you gave it your all, and 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 were and, and the and were the, uh, and you were, uh, you were, were the handiest as you could be uh, uh, with that wall. Uh, and I, uh, is that true? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty true. Uh, it's pretty handy. Uh, he's he's uh, he's he has, and he's always every episode. He had a new idea how to get complete control of motherboard. Ha ha ha! You do remember! Yeah. <laughs> and and, and every, every episode he sets out with great excitement and every plan he tries gets under, <coughs> you know, he never makes it. He never makes it. He never makes Huh? Well, anyway, uh, uh, thank you. I, I almost I almost had my doubts about that. Uh, and, oh, by the way, Gilbert Gottfried was digit. Uh, uh, anyway, the state your statement. Uh, okay, my statement. Sorry. Uh, the, uh, okay, on October 26, 2015, you uh, uh, we were uh, uh, we all were, were given a message from Doc Brown about how basically the future is now and we don't have to worry about it, about uh, about it being uh, it being absolutely futuristic in the truest sense of the word, sir. You are absolutely right. I just want to let you know. Thank you. Thank you. You know, you know, you should be taking my place up here right now. Man, that, it, Christopher, that is a true fan right there, that man, right? Yes. I'd like to thank everybody that's uh, asking questions and coming up. Uh, we're going to limit it to one question per person moving forward, just because I know everybody has a burning question. So um, uh, we'll have to. You'll have to. Be okay. Thank you. What would you like to change from the past? What would you like to see in the future? Great question. What would I like to change from the past? What would I like to change from the future? Um, I don't know because. I, when I started out, I lived, I grew up close to New York City, and I, went to, I, I knew what I wanted to do since I was 13 or 14, I wanted to be an actor. But surprisingly, I, I had no confidence that it would have gone the way it has. I just feel you know, so, so many young people want to be an actor or an actress. So few of us are fortunate enough to, to have it happen for us. Um, when I was in my late twenties, I had a lunch with a relative uh, that I had seen for many years. And he asked me what I was doing. I said, "What well, I do? I'm trying to get a job as an actor." And he kind of looked at me and said, "Chris, wake up." <laughs> It's not going to happen. So it's time to get serious and get a real job. Uh, it didn't happen that way. So, uh, so to, to that, Chris, I would ask, what advice would you actually have for young thespians or people trying to break into the entertainment industry that are surrounded by negativity, unfortunately, from family or friends that don't think that they can make it? Like, What advice would you give them in terms of how to pursue it? Anybody here? Or? 
I tell you, uh, persistence. If you feel you've got it in you, if you feel you want to give something, you just you just have to keep going forward. In spite of being rejected over and over and over again. You just I don't know. The more times I went to auditions and it came to nothing. It would make me more determined. I don't know why. I don't know where I found that, but I just I will not be denied. And you keep going and get your face up on stage, anywhere. Keep going. Did it did it take you did it take you a while, Christopher, to get your first role? Or did you did you have success very very early on in oh, your audition? I didn't have success very early on. Uh, yeah, that that uh, it was, That's a man. I was not, uh, what do you call it? I didn't rock it. <laughs> so you weren't was, an organized success. It just took a long, long time. Um, but it just kept building. You know, it was persist. I love that. All right, next question. Um, so, of course, there's got to be a lot of uh, memories and things associated with the movies, but do you have any thoughts or fond memories related to the attraction at Universal Studios before it met us in? Oh yeah, yeah I, I, I was part of it. You know, they have a whole storyline that while you're waiting to get into the DeLorean before the Back to the Future ride, <coughs> Doc does stuff, he talks about things, and, and I went and with an ex-wife, and we, we did the ride about four or five times, uh, and uh, it was extraordinary, extraordinary ride. Script, or I, 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 
it was still very early in the shoot. And I was still <coughs> groping and trying to you know, uh, find out. Uh, it was working out, but I didn't, I wasn't relaxed in the world yet. You know, I didn't feel like I know how to make this type work in my stage. So, uh, so uh, at that point, the first thing I felt when they said tomorrow Michael J. Fox is taking over, I oh, I think that because I, I put so much into every shot we shot for six weeks. And I thought, I don't know if I could do that again. I don't know if I could match myself. But uh, with Michael's energy and all, we did. Did you guys get an opportunity to say bye to Eric? And he, no, he, he, he just wasn't there. He left Hollywood that hour or so. And I, we haven't run into each other since. Oh, you haven't? Maybe somebody years ago. But, but you, you haven't talked to him since? I don't think so. I, I, I wasn't that, we weren't that close. You know, we, did, we just met on the film. I knew of him and his work. But uh, it was kind of sad. Yeah. Isn't it isn't it weird how Hollywood works sometimes? Have you have you had any roles that you've turned down that you may have regretted later on? Or well, there was a I got an offer for a role back in the late seventies, Mark Scorsese film, and I just didn't trust the situation. It was just been a film in Spain where. What what film was it? Do you remember? Something. I'll say not for you or something. I don't remember exactly. But I, it might have been a better thing to do something. I might have given my career a bit of a boost to that if it went well. You you would have been good in a Scorsese film. Well you'd be good in any film, right folks? I mean, well, that you auditioned for that you didn't, that you think, dang, I know that I still could have really aced that one. That I didn't get? Yeah. Yeah. Can you share one with us? Every one that I didn't get. <laughs> <laughs> is there one that sticks out for you where you're like, I think that's the one that got away? Yeah. No, I agree with you. I don't know what specific one. All right, next question. Yeah. So I don't know. My question is, uh, you know, about the video game that you did, when they played Dr. Brown in his younger years. Um, did they talk to you at all about the script for that, or did you have any involvement in it? No, uh, all, all the writing. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, did all the writing, maybe with some, some collaboration between him and Bob Sinekis. But uh, and they wrote it so well. You know, you didn't feel like, gee, I, I want to go and talk about how the scene is written, because it, it ain't working for me. Everything works. Uh, the conception of God and the language, various the way for to speak, all works right from the, from the start. Um, do you feel like the game um, was a better closure than the third movie, or just added to it? Did you feel you got more closure to the story of the Constitution too? Yeah, I, I feel it was for close man. It ended on a upbeat and uh, the story was fulfilled up until that moment. There weren't any loose ends. And I thought it was filled well. You know, it, it, uh, it seemed like a natural we done it. <laughs> Next uh, question. Love the outfit. Okay, so <laughs> uh, this is not a question. I want to tell you. Could you do it to speak just a little bit louder? Yes. Oh, this is not a question. Just I want to tell you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for everything. Back to the 
what was uh, one feature about uh, the bad solution to trilogy? I had so many people really here today who say thanks for my child being at the, the back of Future Bailey, but some others fill the gap young people's lives at a certain time. I've, and so many people who have seen the film, uh, I bet, said because of the film, they became doctors or surgeons, physicists, scientists, of one type or another. And that's a great film. It's nice to provide entertainment, you know, but, but it's really Makes it makes a crucial difference to people's lives. Um, it's something I'm proud to be a part of. We have time for just a few more questions, so if you do want to get in line, that would be the time to do that. First off, how are you doing, Christopher? Pretty good. Everybody good? Oh, yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, I just figured you have been asked that today. Uh, so back to Future 3, I like best because we want to see your side of the story. A little bit more storyline about you and Morgan Martin, so I thought that was the best one of the first trilogy, if you will. I thought that was a better one. Uh, but my question is, you did guest star roles in Growing in Style, and you did uh, a guest star role in A Million Ways to Die in the West. Uh, these are just little side roles that you did, but they seem to bring a lot of life to the movie, uh, especially comedically, because you have that good reputation from Back to the Future. Is there anything in the future, maybe, that you might be doing? Yeah, I think it's, you know, something interesting about cameo roles. Uh, I, uh, I remember there was a casting director in New York who used to say that there are no small parts, only small actors. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a point, you know. I, get, I have two films coming up where I have an interesting cameo. But they're well written, and it's an opportunity to find a channel, a lot of energy and imagination to a very short period of time to fulfill the certain needs to the script. And I love doing that. I love doing a, a, a lead or a, a substantial character role. But uh, I, I've got two cameos coming up in the last couple of months. They're already keep, keep, keep me up nights thinking about it. Any way by chance? Sorry. Is there any way by chance you can tell us what the movies those are so we can see them? What the movies what are. What the movies are. <laughs> Not really. I haven't done it yet. Um, well, one, one, one is called Nobody. And I don't remember the title of the first one I'm going to do. That's not... That's, that, I, I forget times. <laughs> okay, next question. Did you enjoy being Clue as Professor Paul? Oh, wow. uh, that, that was a ball. Clue. It's funny, it opened modern. Uh, modern opening. You know, it wasn't like a big deal. It was more. It had a greater run in England. They loved the game, and they loved the movie, and all that. But it's a film that consistently, even here today, people talk about movie, like avid fans about it. Yeah. And my, my experience with it, they, they, it was an amazing cast. I mean, they were people who were, who had real, and it was a wonderful ensemble piece because we're so dependent on each other. Love it, it's a lot of fun. I just want to tell you that I see all your movies like a thousand times with my family and my boyfriend right over there. I showed him, uh, I played for him, Clue, and he was laughing every single time. I'm a, I'm a little concerned. I'm a little concerned about your relationship. If you've been watching those movies a thousand times each, how do you have time for that boyfriend? Talk about, I make time. Talk about 
about pinching. Then Only one more? Yeah, then we're going to do something yes. fun. Okay. I love what, seeing you as Uncle Fester in the Alex family. I thought that was a wonderful film. I have a question about the mamushka. Was that fun to do? Mamushka. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was great. With Raul, Raul Jr., bless him. It, it, it was just uh, it was great. And Charles Adams. Still alive when I was a top. And he contributed to the New Yorker magazine, a cartoon every week. Alright? My parents got the magazine and I'd be opening up looking for the Charles Adams cartoon. And my particular favorite was Uncle Fester. It was some kind of mischief, a certain kind of evilness. He wasn't bad. He used to have a lot of mischief. And I would look at that, that for us at eight, nine years old. Then decades later, I get a call. Would I be Uncle Fester in a movie? What are the odds? What are the odds? Real quickly. At, at, at first, I, I thought, how, how is this possible? I don't look like Uncle Fester. <laughs> uh, and, you know, but we got the costume. Would it be possible if I just gave you a quick hug? <laughs> Don't pull me off the stage. <laughs> this is a great way to end though. As we are, I'm going to actually ask, we're going to do a fun picture for the Salter Con that we